Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to 2022. Our webinar tonight, of course, will be on the age of innocent. Okay, well, look, tonight, welcome, everybody. And as you are registering, you'll get to see the uh, get to see the screen. What I'd like to do is uh, introduce our speakers in a moment, but let me first introduce my colleagues. David DeLima is the South Australian Northern Territory Director. I'm the National Webinar Host and also the New South Wales State Director. Um, David and I, of course, have been doing this now for nearly three years, and uh, we've had people from all over the world, as we do tonight, uh, and including UK, USA, and indeed um, politicians and Christian leaders um, from Australia. The topic tonight is, of course, on the age of innocence, the impact of pornography on children, churches, schools, and what have you. And I have two wonderful people here, uh, Dr. Daryl Mead and Marshall Ballantyne Jones, who's also a PhD in medicine. And um, I've had the pleasure of meeting Marshall before at a men's Christian conference, so I can attest to his um, his, his ability to address this topic. And Daryl, of course, um, you, you come highly recommended. And um, in that regard, I just want to quickly say um, that uh, you are, you are the, the, the um, uh, head of the chair of the, of the foundation that you head up. Uh, you've got an interest uh, in, in particular on the internet of pornography. Uh, you've got a wonderful background in particular, having advised the Scottish and the UK governments on the challenge of the digital society. Um, now, Marshall, I didn't know this, but you, you are a reverend and you did do more college, so well done because uh, I have a close connection to more college. And Marshall is married to Rebecca and has children, brought up in the minister's family. His first uh, postgrad career was in business as a financial analyst and computer program, after which she studied at more college. Now, interestingly, Marshall has undertaken research into pornography with particular focus in reducing its impact among teenagers. So having said that, this is one thing I'd like to share with everybody just at the moment, because what we've got here is research by Telstra in 2015. It said that two thirds, 68% of children aged three to 17 <coughs> own a smartphone and an average of 21 hours, 48 minutes per week is spent on their device. And this is 2015. Now, one of the things that also we found out, and this is in our submission to the Australian government's um, uh, inquiry into the age of innocence, and it was uh, submitted by our uh, Victorian State Director. Interestingly enough, if any child aged three to seven he puts the word porn in the research engine of his or her phone or PC and taps go, the first site to appear is Pornhub, free porn videos and sex reviews. Now, that is absolutely disturbing. I've just become a grandfather. I've got a granddaughter and I'd hate to see her. She's only two years old, but she's already know, knowing how to use a phone. Unbelievable. And uh, this is really, really frightening. So what I'd like to do is show you that there was a parliamentary committee here in Australia on, and it recommended mandatory age verification for online pornography and wagering, which is another issue. So having said that, can I ask, um, Daryl and Marshall to take the take the discussion further. Can you all, both of you, say for about fifteen minutes? I'd like to start off with you, Dr. Daryl Mead, if I may. And then once you're finished, we'll go to Marshall, and then we'll go into question time. So please type your questions, and then David will monitor monitor these because we want to leave plenty of time for questions. So could I please um, introduce Dr. Daryl Mead to take the first discussion on this topic? Thank you, Daryl. Thank you very much, Greg, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to Family Voice Australia. As you can tell from my accent, I'm an Australian, but I've been living and working in the UK since the early 1990s. Uh, since 2014, I've been trying to help people understand that pornography has a wide range of effects on health relationships. And I do this uh, along with my wife, Mary Sharp, um, and I've created a charity called the Reward Foundation. Now we've named it after the reward circuit in the brain where all addictions occur, whether it is substances like alcohol to heroin or to behaviors like um, gambling or viewing pornography. And it's also importantly, the part of the brain where we fall in love. 
Um, as I'll outline a little today, at the Ward Foundation, we provide a wide range of tools and training to help people working in the caring professions, including healthcare and clergy, as well as school teachers and parents. For each of the last five years, we've published an academic paper in the peer-reviewed literature on, and our most recent paper was called Problematic Pornography Use, Legal and Health Policy Considerations. It was published in a journal called Current Addiction Reports and is available for free on our website. The Reward Foundation is available at rewardfoundation.org. We're also on all the other social media like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Now, pornography is a complicated subject, and in a short session like today, all I can do is introduce some of the major themes. The pornography industry has turned human sexuality into an industrial commodity. And by very cleverly creating a free distribution model, pornography now reaches an audience which is completely unprecedented. It's having widespread effects on society and around the world, and the majority of them are negative. So today I'll look at mainly at the way pornography affects its consumers, offering some brand new statistics on pornography use by Australians. Uh, in advance, I must offer a warning that much of what I'll now speak of is very challenging, but no pornography is shown. And um, it, it, this, is, this is technical, um, but it is quite challenging. I'm going to first of all do a short PowerPoint, then I will also just do some speak to camera. So if I can do the share screen now. And are we good for Greg for my screen? That's good, Daryl. That's good, right. Okay, thank you very much, Marshall. So pornography used by Australians. Um, how do Australians get their pornography? Well, the simple answer these days is almost exclusively on mobile. Um, nearly 85% of all porn consumed in Australia comes off some sort of a mobile device. Uh, desktops are now only 15%. If we go back to 2015, like the, the first slide that Greg showed, that was about 30, 35% then. Desktops are just not the way it's happening. Now, this is where things get challenging. How long do Australians spend on a pornography site? Well, essentially, it's the same answer as it would be anywhere in the world. Uh, the average is nine minutes and seven seconds. And there's no easy way of saying this, but that says basically how long it takes for you to open your pornography site, to stimulate yourself, masturbate, and to have an orgasm, and then to lose interest in the sexual content. And worldwide, the average is anywhere between about eight minutes and 14 minutes, but it's pretty consistent. Some people will stay on a lot longer. They won't have an orgasm. They'll keep watching. Um, they can do all sorts of things to, to keep themselves engaged. But that's essentially the product. It is you watch, you're stimulated, you leave. Now, we have here um, a distribution according to um, brand new data. This is from December. Um, uh, 2021 of the age of people who are consuming porn in Australia. Now, before you look at the numbers, the important thing here is because pornography is thought of as adult entertainment, there are no statistics for this for children. So about, depending on the country, we think between 20 and 30% more consumers than would be shown in a graph like this are under 18. So the under 18 graph is roughly the same size as the biggest um, char, uh, bar on the chart, uh, around 28%, um, something like that. But essentially, the biggest consumers are uh, people in the ages 25 to 34. But essentially, pornography is used across society. So even um, the over 65s, it's essentially still the same number as the 18 to 24s. So anyway, it's it's indication again that it, it's, it's widespread. The other thing we have is the gender distribution. This is a very interesting story. Uh, roughly three quarters of the people consuming porn um, are males, a quarter females. But what's happened worldwide, and the same is true in Australia, is that you've saturated the market with, with men. And 
all of the market growth or a good portion of the market growth now comes from getting women to watch pornography. And if you, you, you go back um, five years in Australia, the number of women watching would have been about 23%. In every single country in the top 20 porn consuming countries in the world, the number of women proportionately viewing porn as a, a percentage of the total population has gone up every year for the last four years. This is a deliberate push by the porn industry and taken along by a lot of their allies to make it happen, making porn literally sexy and cool. Now, how much porn is being watched? Well, there are four monster websites and the, the ones we've listed here, Xvideos, XN, Pornhub and Xhamster. These, in a world terms, are mega sites. They are numbers 10, 12, 13, and 22 for web traffic in the world. Um, so more people go to X videos than go to Netflix. More people go to X videos than go to Amazon. Um, and collectively, these sites currently, well, 2020 figures, they were getting 371 million visits per day, 365 days a year. In Australia, this is data for the month of December last year. So X videos had 53 and a half million people come, which is almost exactly the double the population of Australia. So the average Australian visited twice. Now that's obviously a false number. The majority of Australians did not go to X video, but an awful lot of Australians went to X videos a lot of times. And the other thing we have here is, um, is growth. Now, in actual fact, there is seasonality. Um, Australians, like people in, in most uh, parts of the world, watch less porn um, when they're not in holiday mode. So um, uh, May, June, July is relatively low for porn consumption in Australia. January, you know, December and January, it's high and the numbers tend to go up. But in the long term trend is also growth. So how can we help at the Reward Foundation? Uh, we have school lesson plans which we make available for free on the rewardfoundation.org um, website. And this is my wife's welcome. We teach about pornography and sexting. We have um, four lessons on pornography and three lessons on sexting. These are lessons for um, between 11 and 18. Some of them are just for 15 to 18 where there's more advanced sexual concepts. We've put them out together over four years and we're trying to make people cr think critically because until there is age verification, every child has access to porn, essentially. Relatively small numbers don't, but the majority do. Uh, we think you have to use a no blame, no shame model so that you'll get engagement. We also offer parents a guide to how to talk to kids because this is one of the tougher things as a parent. I'm a parent and talking about porn to um, an 11 year old or a 15 year old or an 18 year old, it's embarrassing for all concerned. So we look at all the ways that the, and the tools that you can have to help talk to kids. We recommend resources. We have videos to help. We try and address for parents in a simple way, the legal issues. We only specialize in the legality here in the UK, but the laws in Australia are relatively similar. Um, and there are things like sexting. It's important to understand that the nude selfies um, have potential to be illegal. They certainly feed the child abuse uh, market. We also know that people who are on the autistic spectrum um, are overrepresented in a lot of the statistics to do with pornography. So we've got some particular thoughts as to how you can help there. We also recommend uh, a book called Your Brain on Porn written by our late colleague, Gary Wilson. Uh, I will declare an interest here in that um, the Royal Foundation gets royalties um, from the author for this book. But this is the book that established the idea of porn addiction as a brain thing um, and as, as the, the source of sexual dysfunctions and of a lot of pain for people. And look, by looking at it from a behavioral addiction point of view, has given the world a new perspective. It is the number one best-selling book on Amazon for um, it in all the different formats that it does for pornography. And yes, there is such a thing as an academic book on pornography um, that's a bestseller. Um, I'm now going to show a, a brief two-minute video. Um, now, 
warning for anybody who's watching with um, younger children or whatever, you may not want to watch at this point. The video is available on our website and lots of other places. Um, but it has adult concepts and some fairly strong language. Again, still no, no pornography. Um, but at this point in time, this video has now been viewed about a million times around the world. So with no further ado. Gabe started with porn at 12. By the time he was 22, he couldn't get it up even for a girl he was really attracted to. That's called erectile dysfunction, or ED, and it used to be pretty rare. For decades, only about 3% of men under 40 had it. But from 2010 on, rates skyrocketed. Now they're up around 35%. There's a reason for that steep increase. Since 2006, it's become very easy to stream free video porn online and access even the hardcore stuff with a few clicks. Effects took a while to show up, but basically the data says more hardcore porn and fewer hard-ons are connected. After all, guys haven't suddenly become nervous about performing. They can get it up okay for porn, just not with partners. And when they quit porn, their erections come back, but it can take months. No wonder. Brain scans show that compulsive users react to porn like addicts react to triggers for cocaine use. And in a BBC3 survey of young people, 14% of all female and more than 30% of all male participants believed they were actually addicted to porn. And there's more. Research showed that watching a lot of porn made users six times more likely to be aggressive in a sexual relationship. No more boners and issues with your partner seem like an awfully high price to pay for internet porn that's supposed to be free. And that's a lie anyway. Free porn is a business. It helps to sell pills to fix your limp dick. It wants you to pay for premium content or sex aids. And it sells your personal data to advertisers so they can target you better. That's why governments need to step in and require age verification for online porn, just as with alcohol, cigarettes and gambling. When you turn 18, you can make your own decisions. And you'll have a better chance of enjoying actual, real sex with a partner. Until then, skip the porn, save your boner. For help, go to... Uh, that uh, yep. video is based on uh, a guy called Gabe Deem. Uh, he's a colleague of ours. And he's a real person. That's based on his story. My last slide, um, tomorrow and for the next three days, there will be a worldwide international conference on um, age verification called Connecting to Protect. Um, I will be uh, speaking tomorrow on that live. And if anybody wants to join the conference, it's not too late. Um, there will be hundreds of people from around the world. Uh, the conference is based at the University of Calgary in Canada. And okay. I will stop my sharing of the screen and Thank I will you, say Darryl. a few more things. I'm okay to say a little bit more. Yeah, Daryl, um, yeah, a couple of more minutes right? and then we'll get on to Marshall. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, mm. just a minute, get my, mm. my other uh, screen up and running. Um, okay. So I'll now look briefly at some other major negative effects of porn in our society. Um, now, first, the, and, and a mega problem is pornography seems to be creating a new cohort of men who are interested in viewing child sex abuse material, sometimes known as child pornography. A small number of men, perhaps 1% of the population, have a genuine sexual interest in children, and these men will struggle throughout their lives not to become sex offenders. Consuming pornography makes it harder for them to not become sex offenders. Unfortunately, we're now also seeing a new cohort of men who are viewing child sexual assault material, and they are men who've escalated while watching legal pornography. So with problematic drug use, you need more of the same drug to get the equivalent high. With porn, you need new, different, and shocking. And that's leading to a significant number of men watching children being raped in order to get sufficient arousal so they can masturbate. And some in turn may become contact offenders perpetuating the cycle. It's a, a real disaster. I don't have statistics for Australia, but we now know that one man in 50 regularly accesses child sexual exploitation material from the dark web as a part of their ex sexual um, repertoire. And that cannot be right. Mm. 
Now, much of the creation and supply of pornography is controlled by organized crime and a lot involves human trafficking. And again, these are behaviors that we cannot really tolerate in civic society. Uh, pornography consumers become consumers through a series of clear steps. As a young person, you discover porn either accidentally or by searching for things you've heard about on the net. And a recent Australian survey found that 100% of the young male participants they spoke to had seen pornography. It's a reality across society. The industry then grooms you to become consumers. They use artificial intelligence algorithms on the big websites to guarantee that you're getting new content. You'll be shocked with surprise. And that can lead to um, problematic or compulsive use. And people can get stuck in the rabbit hole for a very long time. Now, the good news is it's uh, possible to move on to healing and it's better if people don't have to go through the process of being assaulted by the porn industry, but they can just have a normal life, but healing is possible. Um, there are still um, people, sex therapists out there who will recommend if your marriage has gone stale, watching porn would be a way of reigniting it. This again is not a good idea. Um, Long-term research from America suggests that you double your chance of divorce over a six-year period if you watch pornography. And many women who discover their husband's porn habit feel they have been betrayed. The pornography effectively breaks their wedding vows. It's a form of virtually having an affair and diverting your attention away from your real partner. Uh, more porn is never the cure. Um, no amount of porn will ever love you back. There's also, unfortunately, ample evidence that porn is driving an increase in child-on-child -child sexual assault. Young people are acting out what they see on other children, give them a criminal record and harm the entire trajectory of their life. Uh, we're also seeing the porn industry promote things like uh, strangulation as a sexual activity, promoting it as airplay or breath play. Sexual strangulation is becoming a widespread activity among porn consumers of all ages, including children. And even if it's not fatal when it first occurs, it can have a extremely wide range of health impacts over time. Now we believe in age verification. We participated in the Australian Senate's inquiry back in 2016. And last year we joined the eSafety Commissioner's um, process of gathering evidence in Europe. And I'm confident the eSafety Commissioner will do a good job, um, but we're still not certain the Australian government will implement the recommenda recommendations that they have for effective age verification. And we think that Family Voice has a role in holding the feet to the fire and getting the government to do what needs to be done. And thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much, Daryl. That was um, absolutely informative from my perspective. Um, and uh, I'll come back to you with some more questions in a moment. I'd like to hand over to Marshall and then another about 15 minutes, Marshall. And then we'll go into a question period because I really want to get some questions. Um, and please feel free to go to the chat room, ask the questions. David is monitoring these and then we'll go into question time. In the meantime, let's go to Marshall. Over to you, please. No worries. Thanks. I'll share my screen too, guys. <laughs> that should be up. You see that? Terrific. Uh, it's great to hear Daryl. Um, I've met Daryl online before and I'm a major fan of the Reward Foundation and the excellent work they're doing in advocacy and education in the UK. And a lot of their work dovetails with my work very briefly. My background in regards to pornography research has been to focus on finding solutions to problematic porn behaviours amongst adolescents. The origins of this interest was um, formed when I was part of some uh, church-based committees that were examining the impact that porn was having on their churches. And because of some emerging research internally, as well as what was well stated in the international literature, we knew that porn was having a massive effect on churches, but we didn't have much data on what to do about it. This, the, basically the evidence for reducing the problems many of which Daryl's already alluded to, was absent. So I set about a PhD research task with Sydney University to explore ways to reduce the negative effects on teenagers. I focused on teenagers because I could have access to a lot of numbers and also they were a cohort, which I would deem um, at the most critical um, dimension of this sociological threat because of their young age, because of their vulnerability, because effectively they're still 
um, being abused by access to this. And so it was a, um, a, a good place to start. Out of that, I um, came, uh, basically discovered a lot of really helpful principles from the data, both in my research and other research that I was able to explore that could fast track some solutions that are practical for families, for communities, for schools and for church communities too, for society as a whole, in fact. And out of that study, I should say, I also was able to launch a school-based education program called DigiHelp, which has been tailored for the Australian market uh, to fit under the national curriculum and the New South Wales NESA curriculum um, requirements. But essentially that's a broader program that starts at looking at porn and sexualized media, but also includes social media and sexualized social media's behaviors, as well as legalities of online behaviors, including uh, consent and relationship stuff. So what I've just got in my slides now, are some, as the title says, eight quick tips or eight quick things that parents should know about pornography and social media. Some of my data will repeat what Daryl said, so I'll move through it quickly, but um, we know our kids live in a digital world and you know it's, it's not just having an, a phone or having a computer. The sources of entertainment and information and socialization that our children depend on now just to coexist with their peers is phenomenal. And it's unavoidable to have technology. So the, the statistic that you gave at the beginning, Greg, of how many young people have phones, um, according to a study last year, average age uh, 15, it's now 87% have a phone. So it's gone up. And I suppose that's unsurprising in the way that um, society has moved. But the exposure of pornography um, is very prevalent amongst the young people. And interesting, Daryl, that column which you had underreported in that graph, excellent graph you had is, is the focus point of my study. So maybe some of these figures here might be able to fill in some of the gaps there. Um, uh, but really they're not that, um, they're not that different anyway. The average first time exposure in my studies um, for viewing pornography amongst males and females was 11 and a half. Um, at 15 years of age, 70% uh, of boys and 21% of girls would look at porn regularly. Now that's distinct from Daryl's uh, data before. Um, and I was curious to see that little leap up to 26% for females, doesn't surprise me at all. But the thing is that uh, when I'd say regularly, I mean, they're viewing it monthly or more and, and it's habitual. Uh, most porn is accessed by the internet and most people do it on a phone. Um, sexting, which is using social media or your phones to communicate sexual content, whether it be texts um, or pictures or videos, is reasonably prevalent amongst males and females um, at age 15. And you'll notice here that 30% of males will send some form of sext and 22% of females will send some form of sext. But when it comes to receiving, that number jumps up to 41% for females, which is less than males. And you can't help but conclude that females are vulnerable to receiving and being solicited um, to of sexual content. Now, social media might feel like it doesn't interact um, directly with pornography, but the reality is they're using their phones, they're online all the time, and the average age that a kid starts with their own social media account is 11 and a half, the same age that they are first encountering pornography. Now, by age 15, 98% have a social media account. As of a study that was released uh, last year, at present, the most popular of the teenager apps for social media, uh, uh, Snapchat and TikTok and Instagram. And TikTok has just blown up in the last 18 months. Two years ago, it was, uh, wouldn't have been 1%. So it's amazing how quick things change, but that's a very important principle when it comes to parenting and caring for young people is that their, their world is moving at a rate of knots and we've got to be on our guard. Uh, interestingly, and one of the things that came out of my study was the interplay between narcissism and sexuality. 
Now, as it happens, the more a kid uses social media and the earlier that they start, particularly for self-promotion, the more narcissistic they become. And the more narcissistic they become, the, this will sound strange, but the, the higher their self-esteem and the more likely they are to behave sexually. And uh, that is part and parcel of narcissism. But we're seeing this on large numbers for, for kids who are exposed to social media. What that means is they're far more open to engaging with pornography and sexting behaviours. Um, and the problem with narcissism is as they feel more self-confident, they don't feel as bad about the behaviour and their conduct socially gets poorer and their empathy gets poorer. And so it becomes really complicated. It's a false self-esteem. Um, but uh, as I say, these are now how these issues are merging, social media and pornography. Now, very briefly, because Daryl's already alluded to this with his content, but we know that there are effects from pornography. The brain is where it starts. And a changed brain means a changed attitude and behaviour. And this starts for the person who's a frequent user of pornography. Uh, the interplay between the reward centre, which uh, we call the limbic system, which is what Daryl's foundation is named after, is really the, the location of the brain which gets majorly impacted by sexual activity and through visually using pornography to generate sexual desires that end in orgasm. Now, I don't have time to go too much into this, but uh, the reality is that uh, frequent masturbation overstimulates the prefrontal cortex and has various effects on both um, the capacity to engage, sorry, over, overstimulates the limbic system, uh, but has effects on other parts of the brain, including it important prefrontal cortex, which is the self-control section of the brain, which is in an emerging development stage for young people. Um, and when their brains are very susceptible to uh, long-term effects from short-term um, use, but it also moderates memory, um, it moderates uh, how they get desensitized, also get um, sensitized, which is, strange phenomena when you become in the addiction cycle where your brain becomes more triggered by the neural cue that uh, the pleasurable option is there so they get turned on quicker at the thought of porn but they don't get as excited by it and so they need more to hit the same bars as before and that gets into this descending cycle it's um so uh what so many studies are showing is that the brain changes to an individual who is a regular porn user are serious and they are akin to a drug addict's brain changes. Um, some neurological studies from Cambridge and around the world are showing that the distinction in brain shape of a um, serious cocaine or a meth addict are similar to serious porn users. And although the American Psychological Association is reluctant to define excessive porn use as addictive. My own research more than supports the model of behavioural addiction as they apply to gambling or um, food disorders or computer gaming. So it is, it is serious and it is serious for young people because what happens in a changing brain at adolescence can last um, for life and becomes much harder to undo um, later on. So there's a whole bunch of behavioural and attitudinal effects of young people um, when they are exposed regularly to pornography. I've got some there on my screen there, but I won't read them through. They're well documented, they are real, and they're very concerning. But it's not just the individual effects. Uh, pornography affects other people related to the user. Mm. And this isn't a dimension which in our individualistic society gets very much downplayed, except for when it comes to one area, which I allude to specifically in a minute, and that is the effect of objectification of women. Thankfully, uh, but tragically, um, some voices are emerging across uh, the international landscape. Um, I think in Australia, the Chanel Contos petition that came out in February last year, 2021, as an example. Mm. But I also think of the work of Melinda tankard Reist and, and the Collective Shout movement, where they have been um, highlighting for some time the decimating effect of a society where males consume porn and how it affects the females in that society. So uh, 
we know females feel increasingly insecure about themselves and pressured to be sexual and to look sexual, to act sexual, uh, to um, engage sexually because porn has pornified the minds and society of males. But it's also not just males, it's, it's also in cohorts of their female friends and particularly as is perpetuated on social media by the social media algorithms. And the amount of insecurity, sexualized insecurity that the algorithms feed females makes it uh, inescapable that there are social effects from individuals consuming pornography. In fact, I have this diagram here, which I use in many of my education programs and in my seminars, which try to tries to dispel the myth that it's a private thing and it's not hurting anyone else, so it doesn't matter, which you often get from the user who's who's privately consuming free porn in their bedroom or, or wherever. The reality is immediately when a person consumes pornography, they're engaging with the producers and the performers. Uh, one side's driven by profit and the other side is generally and statistically highly disadvantaged pe uh, people groups who are vulnerable, many of whom are enslaved to the pornography industry even years after they seek to escape um, because their activities in participating in production of porn uh, are per uh, left permanently on the internet and so forth. And so it has a detriment effect on people. Um, and we know that popular culture follows porn culture. And you can think of so many shows now, um, so many themes now, both on Net Netflix and other streaming platforms, um, go back 10 years, the Game of Thrones series, Orange is the New Black, commercials and so forth, and the amount of sexualized content that's in um, those shows and movies and even advertisements and music clips that wouldn't have been around 25 years ago. So society moves in the direction of porn and where society becomes more sexualized, we know that it has a massive effect on, on people's behaviors. Mm -hmm. And younger people, uh, people become more sexually active at a younger age. There's more dysfunction in relationships. And we see that there's this huge wider ripple effect across the world, particularly in third world countries and emerging countries where there's enormous exploitation from the sex industry, which is hand in hand and um, part and parcel of the porn industry where people are trafficked, there's child sexual abuse and there's relationship breakdown. And it really is inescapable that an individual who generates the lust um, uh, or with their lust generates a market um, has this ripple effect through society. So we, it's really important people realise it's not a private thing. Mm. Um, and I mentioned objectification culture and it is a, it is a terrible thing. Uh, relationships that have porn um, are highly affected, as Daryl said before, I don't need to go through those statistics mm. um, in detail, yeah. but uh, marriages that do not have porn are statistically happier and have better sex lives, last longer um, and are more rewarding. Mm. And that's just a worldwide fact. Um, so with that said, some of the data that emerged from my research was also related to um, parenting. And so these things I, I think uh, will be really helpful and, and interesting, even though I'm going to glean through it. But what a parent says to their child, the amount that they communicate makes a big difference to both the age of first time exposure to the um, frequency of use of pornography and of well being factors like emotional stabilities, um, empathy, social conduct, and self esteem. Um, so talking early and talking often and, and making sure that parents engage with their children mm. about the world that the children are brought up with is huge. It's so important. I do encounter parents from time to time who are very resistant to this because they believe if, if it's not mentioned and then their kids, kids won't hear about it and they won't um, have an interest to explore on their own. But the reality is uh, the world is so saturated with sexual messages and the playground is so sex uh, saturated with it, it's inescapable. The worst thing a parent can do is leave the education of sexuality up to the playground and the world. And so we need to get in there earlier. People ask, when should I start talking to my kids about sex? Uh, age 10, age 9? Now sexologists okay, so are suggesting age okay, okay, parents no. that out there and that they need to learn to trust their parents.
Sorry, was that, what was that, Greg? Sorry, Sorry, you went into a blackout mode for a minute, Marshall. It's all right okay, now. Back now, am I back? Yep, you're back normal. Thank you. Yep. So in addition to parents talking a lot, something else which is even more vital is what they do, and that is how they contain and restrict access to technology of their children. It was once heard that parents who are hard with their kids, who are disciplinary, might be um, uh, have a negative effect on their kids. But all research that I've done and that I've looked at out there um, uh, uh, overwhelmingly supports that when parents have boundaries and restrictions mm. for their children, it leads to positive outcomes in their children's behaviour and their attitudes, but particularly in the engagement with pornography. And so it's vital that parents have rules about when they can access their devices, where they access their devices, whether there are screening um, programs on it uh, that prevent access to certain um, risky sites and so forth. They should have access to their social media accounts. Mm. They should make sure the kids um, don't have um, secrets and those sorts of things. And as they reach um, mid, ad, mid to late adolescence, they can start weaning them off that as trust gets built and as the kids are able to have um, skill and resilience themselves. Okay. Now, another dimension which is really important for when a, uh, what influences a kid's engagement with pornography is their peer groups. And so there's two dimensions here that I want to talk about. One is peer culture. That is what they perceive to be normal for their age group. And they... They get this not just from their friends, but from media, from society, from the broader playground. They're very susceptible to trends and so forth. And when they believe that pornography is an acceptable thing amongst uh, the broader culture, they are going to be positive to it themselves. Mm. And so um, this requires them to understand and be critical of of their peer culture and that what a parent needs to walk them through. But another factor that um, interplays here is their close friends. What we know about um, teenagers and young people is that what their closest friends do and mm. believe about pornography and sexualized media has the biggest effect on how much they're going to engage into this themselves. And so it's vital that parents think about the friendship circles that their kids have, that they are um, aware of their friends, that they seek to get like-minded friends and families with same principles because those um, um, close peer groups become a competing force against the broader peer um, cultural influence. In fact, with good education and facilitation, those smaller groups can become quite a force of critiquing um, and opposing the broader narratives uh, uh, for the betterment of the child. Um, one uh, criticism that I frequently hear, and maybe Daryl, you hear it as well when people uh, hear an education program on pornography, um, what that entice excessive interest and won't that lead to harm the reality is that that is not true and not only was that overwhelmingly supported in my own study but i've looked through dozens and dozens of international studies on this related to sex education pornography education and so forth and it's just not true it does not increase interest in the use of pornography at all but it increases um a desire not to a view pornography B, have a better attitude to women and be less likely to engage in earlier sexual behaviour and so forth. Uh, nor does, uh, I should say, a parent who is engaging with rules and conversation and engagement with the peer groups that they have, as well as educating their kids, uh, does that negatively impact the, re the relationship between the child and the parent? In fact, parents and children who... Um, who engage in these conversations, behaviors actually have a stronger relationship. It doesn't affect friendship groups either. So um, all these points here are really, really helpful. Last one, which I think might be really useful for the family voice communities mm -hmm. to find encouragement in is that, that faith makes a difference. So the more religious a family is, and when I look at my own data, when I say religion, I'm generally looking at the Christian faith uh, and most international studies encompass Christianity as the as the as the major um, sample size for the, these studies, but it's not exclusively Christianity. Mm -hmm. But where a family is engaged actively in a faith-based um, community, it makes a big difference to their children's behaviour and attitudes, both immediately in the engagement of pornography, but also in many other wellbeing factors, including their emotional stability and their empathy and their conduct and their self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And so uh, let that be an encouragement that it's mm -hmm. it's called 
people to prioritize their church lives over social lives for their children that that and to live it themselves not just to send them off to sunday school whatever because these things make a difference mm. so there's some okay. stuff that i had i have some more slides which um i could speak to if someone really wants to but um look as daryl mentioned neuroplastic change is a really important dimension when it comes to the process of getting healing from problematic pornography behavior mm -hmm. so when you're talking about 15 year olds i should say uh, that they they very much can be addicts and when you think about a 15 year old boy who first got exposed to pornography secretly at eight or nine which is pretty common um but you know average 11 and a half and has been masturbating multiple times a week if not a day year in year out by the time it gets to 15, his whole sexual system has been utterly and completely rewired and warped, and it's very, very difficult for them to stop. Um, but understanding neurology is a really, really important part of, of how you're going to move forward. Um, abstinence is a really important location that you want to arrive at for the person who's who's um, dealing with this, because you do really need to reboot the brain as people use that language. You need to start to get um, clean and then introduce alternative activities which fill the gap in the brain um, and as well uh, teach and build up um, all sorts of um, techniques and management methods to help people come through. Um, you, if you find out a kid has been looking at pornography for a while, um, chances are you'll, you'll probably need to start putting these things into play to help them recover quickly. The brain's plastic, that means it changes. So overuse of negative stuff will have a bad effect in, um, impact but over time overuse of good stuff has a healing and positive impact and so that's that's important to stick at um, lastly for anyone who encounters problematic pornography behavior there's no quick fix it's a process not an answer mm -hmm. so this seminar hopefully gives some good data between Daryl and myself there's lots of other great stuff out there but if people want to just click their heels and hope a problem goes away, it won't. The time it takes to build the problem is probably proportionate to the time it's going to take to undo the problem. It's going to be, for many people, years. Um, that's sobering, but it's not hopeless. Many people have recovered from porn addiction and had savage porn addictions. And so you can get there. Better than overcoming a porn addiction is preventing a porn addiction, which is why I, I think it's so important that education and preventative measures at a young age and an education level in schools and in a community as well is vital. Mm. I also put submissions to that age verification um, inquiry last year. I'm delighted that the government has in principle accepted the findings of that. Mm. We'll wait to see if that happens. We need lobbyists like Family Voice to keep onto them and, and push them to implement. Mm. Um, but you know, it's a it's a starting point uh, because you know the first time exposure stats say that um, more more people than not encounter it accidentally yeah. Yeah. first time. And but you know once you see it, it's it's traumatic and uh, it leaves an impression. So to avoid even that with age verification is really helpful. Okay. That's my um, okay. that's uh, my uh, presentation. So thanks, thanks. God. Thank you, um, Marshall. Um, get the screen back uh, very quickly. Look. That, that, they are outstanding pieces of information. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to hand over to David in just one second because there are, we'll have time for a few questions. Um, Daryl, I was very um, uh, sort of <clears throat> raised a, uh, a flag with me when you said that women felt betrayed when men were involved in, um, in, in some form of pornography. And it, uh, it, it reminds me of, um, from our biblical perspective, Daryl, uh, Matthew 5, 27, 28, if you look at another woman, you know, you've committed lust in your own heart already. And that was discussed in our men's group not long ago, in our Christian men's group, that, uh, you know, these are real issues, Daryl, and, and it's interesting that the, the wife does feel, feel betrayed. And your partner and I, I kept telling my own wife that, uh, you know, this is a fascinating discussion. Daryl, are there more people that deny that they're looking at porn or... or or is, or is it the, the figures you've presented pretty accurate, you know? So what do you mean by deny they're looking at porn? porn well, I think yeah. a lot of men say, oh, no, I don't look at porn, you know, but oh, in fact, right. yes, they yes. do. And they, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> the, well, clearly, the worldwide, the, the numbers of people using porn are more than a lot of people will self-admit. 
but we, we see this across society now that it's clear that people are using porn. I mean, uh, if you watch, say, stand-up comedy, there's almost no stand-up comedy routine that's got to the top of the game in the last 20 years that doesn't have something about porn. It is, yep. it is clearly out there. But because it's a private thing, people don't want to say, you know, put your hand up, say, I do a lot of porn. That's not something that most people will do, men or women. But underneath, if you get onto a one-to-one -one situation with them and, and discuss it in a supported environment, you'll discover much more. Often men who are going through um, trying to understand how they are as men, when they do get to have a talk about things, one of the biggest things that worries most of them is how much porn they're using mm. and what the negative impacts are. Yeah. But it, it, there's always going to be a contradiction. It's not easy to talk about, but it's important. That's yeah. it. In our men's group, I was just saying, I had that to David now, but in our men's group, in our Christian men's group, um, last year there was a scam going around, Daryl and Master, you might have heard of it. We got an email saying, hand over 500 euros or whatever, because I've now tracked all your porn oh, sites yes. that you've been looking at. <laughs> well, our men's group, everyone's going, oh, gee, you know, I got one of those, I got one of those. And I'm saying, guys, it's all right, it's a scam, you know. <laughs> uh, but and it's real very, as well. Yeah. That, yeah. These things are real. We've, we've, yeah. we've interviewed people whose families have been hit by these scams yeah. and who have literally as a result and they have been masturbating online mm. on a chat room and they have had real calls from people um, who are effectively okay. trying to farm them yeah. and they've called the police and they've had like um, a gay boy of 17 had to tell his his mother and father going to the bedroom at two o'clock in the morning the police are about to come oh. um, I've now encountered this it does happen for real mostly yeah. it's, it's a fake scam Mm. But there are also real things, danger. Yep. Um, Understood. Don't, yeah. don't masturbate on screen with a with your camera turned on. It's, it's scary. <laughs> Understood. It's crazy. David, have we got a couple of quick questions for us there? Yes. Uh, the first question to Daryl: Why the disparity between male and female porn watching? We think it's to do with the way the sexual template in men and women works differently men are much more visual and the commercialized porn is essentially a visual language you're seeing other people having sex and that's the way it works um, and we know that men and women think about relationships and sexuality in a different way so the easy thing for the industrial porn is to find the root into the men's brains but as men and women are both being trained by this thing um, the disparity is is starting to go away in the philippines um, it's 39 percent women um, um, 61 percent men um, so the the gap there has really started to close right up um, that's just where we are okay is it, is it the case that girl, is it the case that girls in particular are watching in order to learn what to do it's like an educative process for them there's a little bit of that, but I think that that's much over-egged as a concept. No, it's mostly because it's sexually stimulating. After all, you can only plug human beings together in so many ways. There's actually very little you need to learn. It is about the stimulation. And that's just, again, um, the, the nature of, of who we are and what we are. Sex, we're, we're all here for evolution. Uh, sex was invented about a billion years ago. And uh, we are here because every generation going back infinitely into the past has been successful in reproducing. That is totally important. But men and women have different sexuality. Women bear babies, they have eggs, men have sperm. It's, it's, it's different. And that is acted out through the porn. Um, uh, question, for, question for Marshall. Uh, church is taking the problem of porn seriously. And how widespread is the problem of pornography among clergy? Uh, two great questions. There is a emerging interest by churches to take the issue of pornography seriously. For example, the where my tribe um, is Sydney, uh, Sydney Anglicans. And back in 2013, they started a panel. Their archbishop started a panel um, about pornography. That was, that was what originally got me into thinking about this issue. Um, so they've, been, they've gone back some time because they were aware that, um, in answer to the second question, there were a number of clergy who get 
impacted. So I've been involved in some studies of clergy groups um, uh, around our country, and I've looked at some studies internationally that uh, focus on um, faith-based leadership groups, and uh, they are surprisingly high. Uh, there's very little distinction uh, amongst Christian groups and secular statistics um, and Christian leadership and secular statistics. So, uh, and the younger you get, mm. the got, basically anyone who grew up with the internet, anyone had internet access as a teen, um, is much higher, uh, has a higher risk of, of mm. having a normalised, I guess, pattern of behaviour when it comes to the, those statistics. So, yeah, they, they, they are surprisingly high um, and... But I, I, do, I can attest that a lot of churches are wanting solutions. Um, one of the ministries that um, I'm launching this year is called Resist. And Resist is a uh, support group, um, faith-based support group um, uh, program that is designed to uh, give quick access to large numbers of people in churches to, to get some support, um, not only with porn, but some other social uh, online behaviours as well. It's not just pornography that, that people get enslaved to, but um, uh, it's the big one. Um, just before the next question, David, um, I'm going to try something. I'm not sure if Tony McClellan can hear me. Uh, you might have a question, Tony. Are you there? I'm here. Yes, I am. Do you have a question, Tony? Tony is um, the former chairman of Australian Christian Lobby, so um, he's written a book last year on A Glorious Ride, a wonderful Christian book. And um, I'm not advertising this, Tony, but do you have a question for the panel? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I founded a software company in the US called clickchoice.com to, to battle pornography and founded an organization. So I respect the work of these two fine men. And quite frankly, I didn't realize that it had exploded so much through uh, poten potentially or principally through the, uh, uh, through the use of mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And it's quite frightening. And uh, I'm passionate about trying to find a way mm -hmm. to stop it, especially when I think of our grandkids. Yeah, thank you, Tony. David, you've got one more question and then we'll close in prayer, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, a uh, question for Daryl. Is the UK making progress to protect children? What can we learn from the UK's approach in Australia? The UK is making progress. The government having procrastinated. We only got to age verification in 2019. The government just before the election decided that mm. it might put uh, male voters off um, if they had to prove that they were over 18. Uh, but last week, the government, as a part of their new online safety bill, has said they will go forward and cover both uh, commercial pornography suppliers and pornography access through social media. Um, and, and what we can learn from the, uh, uh, the, the UK situation is that the technology to do the blocking is, is successful, but it's already working perfectly well for gambling, for buying solvents and all sorts of things. Um, the tactics that the government um, has faced in terms of the porn industry and it shills scaring people um, can be very effective. So you have to recognize that even though you're pushing from the side of good, there's plenty of people pushing from the side of porn on the other side. Uh, people want their porn. So it, it's a matter of um, sensible government can produce a better environment for our children and for our society. Uh, and you can take people with you, but that is always going to be a challenge because individual freedom and net freedom is seen um, and privacy issues are all seen as very important. They are important, but they're all achievable in this case. And the UK example, I believe, um, covers this. Um, just a quick one from Marshall. I don't know if we put out a press release a couple of weeks ago on, on, on the... Um, on, on the TV show on Channel 9 called, uh, you know, Married at First Fright, whatever it's called, you know. And, um, and quite frankly, that is nothing short of soft porn. Surely those sort of things must have an impact on young children watching that. And same thing with Love Island. I mean, 
you know, it, it's understandable why children might get caught up in this. What's the solution, Marshall? I mean, you know, you headed it in your diagram. You said advertising was a was a factor. Any quick comment before David closes in prayer? Yeah, look, um, the, the simple reality is uh, mainstream media is pushing these r ridiculous concepts which are highly sexualised and mm. even sexualised in their ads. Um, so uh, married at first sight commercials that were uh, emerging in the recent was it the cricket season um, in January, no, the, over the when the tennis was on yep. Australian Open, mm. um, included, you know, nude people in a bath and you could tell that they were nude, right? And this is in prime time. So, mm. I mean, what does a parent do there? You, you can put a blindfold over your kids uh, and, and, you know, hope for the best. But I think what um, parents need to be ready for is a conversation when they see mm. that. And they need to be armed with how to address the broader issues related to that. Not just like, oh, that's really bad, mm. we don't do that. But you need to be prepared to talk about relationships and mm. marriage and uh, what makes a successful relationship and why, um, the, you know, what's going on with those shows and how they're trying to trick people into watching them through selling, um, you know, objectification and use it as a chance to talk about how women are disadvantaged by this culture and how, you know, how hypocritical the media is when they're upholding mm. uh, a, 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 a cause over here while at the same time over here are perpetuating this objectification culture for, for commercial gain. So, you know, you can have those discussions with your kids if you're upskilling your knowledge and you prepare in advance and then you can walk them through it. And what they leave that with is not only a bit of information, but they see a parent who's confident and who's trustworthy and who has a better narrative than what they're seeing there. And that will have an enormous impact on them. Thank you, Marshall. David, I think we'll commit our session to prayer, please. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, let's pray. Our Father, we give thanks for the instruction we re received tonight, the information. We do pray that we will put it to good use and that uh, Family Voice and the, the two groups represented by our speakers uh, will be blessed by you as we mm. seek to combat the scourge of pornography, the harm it does to marriage and the family, mm. as it assists child molestation, is linked to rape and commodifies women uh, especially. And so we do pray for our churches especially, that they would really stand up and that the pastors of our churches would lead the way and that our churches would really shine the light of truth, not only to explain. Thank you, Dave. Uh, David. I think you've um, dropped out. Well, look, um, are you back, David? Yeah. So okay. uh, thank you. Yes, Amen. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. All right. <laughs> uh, Daryl, Marshall, thank you very much. Um, family Voice is about you know, ensuring that the family does stay intact. Um, the natural family in particular, and anything that does to harm the marriage, uh, biblical marriage in our, in our perspective, the, the natural family, we've got to make sure that we don't get caught up in all the secular trends of, um, you know, getting into the, into the um, mindset that, you know, this is all good for us. It's not good for us. And I value the information you've shared with us. This will be recorded. It has been recorded. It will be available in about three or four days. And I want to thank both of you sincerely for sharing with us the, the problems that we as uh, fathers, mothers, parents share and, um, and, and do in, in, in term encounter at, at all levels, whether it's at work or at home or indeed at, uh, at church. So thank you very much. Good night, everybody. On behalf of Family Voice, thank you for being with us and we look forward to the next uh, webinar on the 8th of March. Good night, everybody. Good night, Marshall, and good night, Daryl. Thank you, David, thank for you. your help. Good night. Okay.